This is the BBC. Thanks for downloading this episode of In Our Time. There's a reading list to go with it on our website and you can get news about our programmes if you follow us on Twitter at BBC In Our Time. I hope you enjoyed the programmes. Hello. In 63 BC, Marcus Tullius Cicero was elected as one of the two consuls in Rome, the highest political position, a remarkable rise for someone born outside the establishment. One of his goals was to stabilise the Republic, which was under threat from armed conspirators, aristocrats who claimed to be men of the people, and generals who would be tyrants. He suppressed a revolt to great acclaim, executing the ringleaders without trial, only to be exiled for this act once their supporters were in power. Exile gave him time to develop his ideas about the form the Republic should take if it were to survive, how the powers would be balanced within it, how to reconcile duty with self-interest, and how to deal with tyrants, the true enemies, as he saw it, of the people. With me to discuss Cicero's life and political philosophy are Melissa Lane, the class of 1943 Professor of Politics at Princeton University, Catherine Steele, Professor of Classics at the University of Glasgow, and Valentina Arena, Reader in Roman History at University College London. Melissa Lane, what was Cicero's background? Cicero came from a town outside Rome that had only recently been given the privileges of full citizenship. So he was a Noah's homo. He was a new man whose family hadn't had historically political power or political office in Rome. So he really had to make his way on his own merits. But what did his family have? They were... They were they were wealthy enough. Can you give us a, a bit more than that, please? Yeah, they were, they were wealthy enough um, to be able to give him a good education, um, to support his desire to study first philosophy in Athens and then to move to Rome. But they didn't have the history, the legacy. They didn't have the patrician standing um, that would have made his path in politics easier. They didn't have the network in Rome is what mattered, didn't they? Yeah, not to that extent. Interesting, they went to Greece, isn't it? They're going back to Greece to learn. It's fascinating. They, it, uh, it is. It was a, it was a, a thing that many, or some anyway, uh, ambitious and intellectually ambitious young Romans wanted to do. And Cicero traveled throughout Greece. He studied in Athens, but went elsewhere to meet leading philosophers in Rhodes and in other places. Um, and he later sent his son to do the same. In Athens, would he have been in, in some sort of contact? I know they're all dead. I'm not talking about <laughs> anything spooky. In some sort of contact with, with the great Greeks we're very often talking about on this program. Yes, yeah, so he, he studies all the schools of um, Hellenistic philosophy that were alive at the time and with some of their great figures, so the Stoics, the Epicureans. He, his own allegiance was more to the skeptics, um, so he took the view that you could you could support whatever argument seemed most plausible. But of course, he became a great admirer of Plato, and his political works are very much written in dialogue with Plato. So he got cracking, learned a lot there, and then he, as I said in the introduction, by the age of 42, which was young at the time, found it born the youngest ever, he became a uh, consul, one of the two consuls uh, in Rome. How did, how did he get there so quickly? So he had to climb the ladder, as it were, the run the course of, of offices, of honors, which was a series of elections. They weren't elections quite as we know them. They're first past the post, but by groups of classes organized by wealth. So there's a different structure to Roman elections. But what really made his name actually was a legal prosecution that he brought in the year 70 um, against a, a, a former governor of Sicily who was being accused of extortion bribery, murder, corruption on a vast scale. And Cicero prosecuted this man. He went to Sicily where he had previously served in a lower office, collected amazing trunks and depositions of evidence, came back and won the case um, against Rome's greatest advocate at the time. And that was really um, the moment that he stepped out from the ranks of strivers um, and, and became someone to be reckoned with. Winning is rather a mild word. He was so strong that the, the, the chap Beres fled the city that, before right, the end before of the trial. That's right, before the end of the trial. No, that's right. And Cicero, right. being Cicero, and for anybody who done, still published all that he was going to say had the man stayed there. That's right. <laughs> I like that bit. <laughs> <laughs> but that set him off. So he set off as a mm. lawyer, a very successful lawyer. Why was that city so intrigued and, and, and pleased by someone who came up through the law? 
Well, the law was the place where you could speak in public. Um, so he, the, the prosecutions, the courts were held in public so the citizens could attend. Um, and it was a chance to really make your oratorical powers felt. You know, it was really a, a gladiatorial duel of a kind. Um, and so he was able through that both to impress some of the leading men in the Senate, um, but also to um, win favor among the people. Catherine Steele, uh, we come on the Catalan conspiracy soon after that. What was the Catalan conspiracy and how did it come to be a conspiracy? Well, one of the difficulties in getting to grips with the Catalanarian conspiracy is that much of our initial evidence for it comes from Cicero, who of course had suppressed it and therefore has a very particular story to tell about the wickedness of Catiline um, and the extent to which this is a threat to the Republic. Can you give us a bit about Catiline, please? Catiline was a patrician politician. Like Cicero, he was aspiring to highest office, but he failed to get there. And one of the origins of the conspiracy seems to have been his failure to be elected as consul and looking there for, to widen his support base with a view to a second attempt on the consulship. And when that failed in the summer of 63, that seems to be the point at which he explored other routes um, to power. Like particularly... killing all the Senate. <laughs> well, that's, that's one of the things that Cicero said he was planning to do. Um, certainly there's, there's more substantial evidence of a military uprising in Etruria and to use military force in order to acquire power in Rome. And that was what Cicero was was trying to warn the Senate was the danger and eventually convinced them was the danger and then a process was set in motion which ended both in military action but also the deaths of some of Catiline's co-conspirators. The way in which he got to know shows that he was a man who had enormous contacts and networks of power. He kept being tipped off, didn't he? He Cicero? did, yes. He kept talking about the um, uh, the information that had been given to him about the conspiracy and the trigger for the famous debate um, in which the decision to execute um, Catiline's co-conspirators was taken was being tipped off that they were in negotiation with a Gallic tribe um, and then Cicero was able to catch them red-handed with letters which um, indicated the, the scope of those negotiations. It shows him being very proactive or somebody that people wanted to curry favour with and be on the side of. Which was it? Well, I think it's a bit of both. Right. Always um, is, isn't it, when you ask a question like that? Yes. I mean, he's, he's <laughs> developing his networks, but because he's consul, he has, he has things to offer people who bring him information. Yes, but he got key information at key times. With a, a day or two to go, he had it, and he talked him. He talked him out as he were inside the Senate and so on. Didn't he? Yes, yes, because then he was able to set up this um, dramatic um, revealing of the evidence. Um, in which the conspirators were brought in with the letters still unsealed. So he took the gamble that they would contain what he thought, they, thought those letters would contain. And then they're opened in the Senate, and they do. And he, he can take things forward on that basis. So he suppressed this conspiracy. The, some of the conspirators had another go, and he rounded them, them up, he, 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 and he had them executed. But he did not give them a trial. But nevertheless, when he executed them and cleared, cleared the decks of the conspirators, he was lauded in Rome, wasn't he? At the time, yes. And, well, again, we're dependent on Cicero for the accounts, but the being uh, escorted back home by the torchlight pro um, procession, being acclaimed in the Senate as pater patriae, father of his fatherland. And, of course, one of the reasons that Cicero was so pleased about all of this was that his career had been um, entirely civilian. And Rome was a society in which some of the highest rewards tended to be restricted to those who had been militarily um, victorious. So as a civilian consul who nonetheless saved the res publica, that was tremendously exciting as a, um, a basis for further reputation. But of course, it does all go horribly wrong for him. <laughs> yes, we can come to that in a moment, mm. but you, you prepared it for it going horribly wrong. But at that time, it was at a fair height of his powers, wasn't he? he yes. uh, and it was an extraordinary rise. And we, we mustn't gloss over this because it gets to be more and more important. But being that important and that influential and that effective, that young in those terms, was terrific. Well, yes, um, and I think Melissa has already pointed to the um, the way that Cicero built his career through effective oratory in order to put together a coalition of supporters. There's the possibly spurious um, Commentariolum Petitionis, the commentary, little book about electioneering, which may be written by his brother, it may not be. But it seems to capture the advice to give Cicero that in order to be elected as consul, which was this huge challenge for somebody without the political and historical background at Rome, he needed to appeal to as broad a possible an audience. And we can see in Cicero's oratory up until the consulship the great care not to offend anybody. So, uh, and indeed early in 63, he claims to be a popularis consul, a consul who's speaking for the populace. 
Uh, Valentina Arana, can we um, tell, can we develop that? Um, his, his, his manoeuvring is very good. His, pl- his political with a small p and a big p seems to be very good. Um, but did he, at that early stage, early in his, his career as we know it, embody ideals which appealed to people? Because in his later essays, and that he certainly did. Was he at that stage thought of as a man of ideals, a man of vision? Yes, certainly by by sixty three he was uh, a man of of vision, and but mainly his vision at that stage was the one that uh, of the that what he calls the Concordia Ordinum, so the concord, the harmony amongst the members of the elite. So what he claims uh, in uh, in that his his great achievement in having suppressed the Catalan the Catalan conspiracy was very much to have united behind him uh, the elite and. For him, that was perhaps the most important achievement in terms of the world of ideas. There was, uh, I mean, if you think about Concordia, is cum cors, so is a cause, the heart that moves in the same direction, as if, you know, the members of the elite feel in the same way, they move in the same direction for the well being of the community, of the, of the for the common good. Uh, but of course it doesn't last long as uh, Catherine has already... No, but he did, he did capture them and they were a small elite and he was not part of them and the one thing he lacked was always not being part of the, in a, in a big sense, the political family in Rome and he got them on his side there. Yeah, he was and he wasn't in the sense that he, he was an equestrian. So he, um, that meant in essence by the late Republic that he his family... F- had was of sub- substantial wealth, and uh, um, the the equitas by the late republic did play a key political role as well alongside the the senators. So throughout his life, he does battle consistently uh, the uh, the being the new man to be uh, the outsider, the one who doesn't have a consular ancestor in his family. You know, in his background, but he is a consul. He has become a consul himself at that stage, and he is one of the equitas. And therefore, for he thinks, and he does, he makes sure that we don't forget it. That he now has made it, and not only has made it, he's made it big time, as uh, as Catherine said. But also, as Catherine alluded to, we must face this now. After, quite after a short time, this very victory turned turned against him because he had not. He had sent these people, sentenced these Roman citizens uh, to death without judging them, and this was considered in itself to be a terrible thing to do. And the the elite, a lot of the elite, turned against him for that. Yes, <clears throat> yes, it did. Um, in uh, um, uh, putting the Catalan conspirators to trial uh, to death without trial, what he did, he violated one of the essential civic rights of Roman citizens, and that was the right to provocatio, so the right to trial. Uh, by doing so, what he did uh, was violating uh, the uh, one of the liberties of the Roman people, and that w- could not be considered acceptable within a republican framework. Therefore, uh, by the time he and and the mood, the political mood, mood because of that, turned against him quite straight away at the, at the end of his consulship already he was not allowed to to uh, in his final speech when he, he finishes when he lay down the office he was not allowed to to carry out the full speech uh, where he could therefore you know boast of his uh, activities and it didn't take long uh, for uh, his arch enemy uh, Claudius to pass a law according to which those who had killed Roman citizens without trial should go on exile. And he went on exile? And yes, uh, he actually <laughs> prevented it in a way. As soon as uh, he, uh, he, the first law was, uh, was passed, um, he went on voluntary, voluntary exile. As soon as he left Rome, uh, a second law was passed, and this time around the law had his name on it. Uh, so to a certain extent there are some degree of... Um, there is a certain degree of questions about the legality of this because that was a privilegium so an ad nominum law Uh, uh, but regardless he was already in exile and and he clearly 
uh, this time around, at least, he had said uh, he, he, right in a sense <laughs> that Claudio was solely after him for that, and the result was that um, because he was therefore presented as the tyrant because he had violated Roman one of Roman liberties, and therefore he had uh, his house was raised to the ground, his properties was confiscated. And what was perhaps most astonishing, uh, Claudius built on the grounds of his house and the foundation a temple to the goddess Liberty. It may, may not have been a temple, maybe an edicula, but... Minister, who was this Claudius who was such an enemy of Cicero? The irony was that he had been a younger man whom Cicero had befriended in earlier years. Um, and then at a certain point, um, they there was a political parting of the ways. Um, Claudius uh, was someone who violated, uh, flirted with violating and ultimately transgressively violated Roman civic norms. Um, so the the nadir of um, his career was being found out to have dressed up in women's clothing and um, insinuated himself into the inner sanctum where um, religious rites were being practiced that only women were supposed to witness. But at this moment, um, uh, he's able to, he's quite popular in the city. He has a lot of following among the, the the plebeians, and uh, he's able to wield that power against Cicero. What did Cicero do in exile, and how did he organize his return? What did he do, first of all? Um, he uh, moaned quite a lot. <laughs> um, he wrote letters to lots of people, um, trying to figure out what he might do and whether he might be able to go. So he went off to Asia Minor and um, kind of uh, actually had quite a lot of difficulty at the beginning finding anyone who was even willing to receive him because it was thought to be you know, um, a difficult thing to do. Um, ultimately, he is able to come back and even some years later holds a, another um, a, a governorship of a province so he doesn't you know he's able to come back um, for a certain period into into the fold has he begun writing his essays and reflections at this stage not quite no, um, no. not quite yet or not that's not the major period of his literary production that comes a few years later once he's returned to Rome but then found himself in more political difficulties and ends up spending quite a lot of time outside the city itself on one of his estates and that's the first major period of his writing Mm -hmm. Catherine Steele, so he, he comes back uh, and there's turbulence in it. Can you just describe the state of Rome, the state of the uh, of Rome and the Republic? Well, turbulence indeed. A number of factors are coming together. Um, Clodius has um, been slightly eclipsed. He's no longer holding the office of Tribunate of the Plebs, which gave him the legal authority to challenge Cicero back in 58. But the popular politics that he's espousing, um, he still has support. He's looking to rise up the curses himself, hold the preachership, eventually hold the consulship, though that never happens. At the same time, um, there is the military power translating into political power of Pompey and Caesar. Um, and effectively, Pompey and Caesar had joined forces in 59 um, in order to support their mutual interests. And that relationship had got a bit rocky. And that the relationship is getting a bit rocky at precisely the time that Cicero returns in 57. So initially he thinks, aha, I can resume my position of authority guiding the res publica. But in the spring of 56, after a period of about eight months in which Cicero is very active um, and is very much trying to be an independent politician, getting his house back, quite apart from anything else, um, Caesar and Pompey patch it up. And that's the point at which they say to Cicero, look, back off. <laughs> um, you, you do what we tell you, or, yeah. or you're, kind of, you're not going to do anything. And that's the point at which he um, very reluctantly acknowledges that perhaps his service to the race publica has to take a different form, and he starts writing the great political treatises of the mid-50s. Can we be begin on those great treatises, Valentina? There are several of them, and we won't have time to do, to do all of them by any means. Um, what is he basically trying to do in his writing about the Republic, about rhetoric, about public office? and so on? Um, well, of course, he's trying to do... Uh, specifically, he's trying to do different things in, in, in different texts. However, overall, he certainly tried to find um, a kind of a recipe uh, for to restore uh, 
a republic that might even never have existed in a, such a uh, wonderful state that has uh, this mixed and balanced constitution that he thinks at some point a realm embodied in the 5th century BC. Uh, but, but uh, you know, that as far as we know as historians, uh, the only record we have is comes from very late sources. So, you know, uh, was certainly part of the Roman uh, intellectual tradition more than perhaps the reality of things. So what was it? Is, <clears throat> what was this mixture he was going back to and said this had happened once and we can make it happen again? What was it? So it was uh, um, a balanced uh, forum and uh, forum of constitution mixed of three main elements. There was a monarchical a more monarchical element uh, represented by the consul uh, and an aristocratic element that was represented by the senate and uh, a democratic element that was represented by the popular assemblies. To be precise, actually, Cicero, rather than talking about institutions to which he refers, he also talks about political ideals. So he's actually a mixed and balanced constitution between auctoritas, so authority of the Senate, the protestas, the power of the magistrates, and the liberty of the people. And when there's these three elements, these three uh, the different components, find an harmonious way of cooperating with uh, each other, then the Republic could function properly. Did he think he was uh, putting forward a, a viable prescription, something that was practical that they would listen to and uh, try to put into practice? Now he is, when he's thinking and writing about the, the, the Republic in this specific case, and as well as the Legibus, we are in uh, the in the fi late 50s. So 54, uh, the, the Republic was finished in 51. And it's very much the world that Catherine has described. So Rome was really a mess, was completely chaotic. In 52, even we have Pompey that was elected consul sine collega, so sole consul. So, you know, a republic that has been based on this idea of the power sharing element was no longer there. This so, is partly to do with the generals themselves becoming very powerful. The empire's expanded a great deal. They're coming back with great loot and great and soldiers who are, who are loyal to them rather than to the republic, and that has tipped the balance quite strongly. Yeah, you certainly have a big uh, the, the 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 army itself played a huge role, but we should not underestimate also this the social and um, economic uh, changes that happened throughout the republic. Perhaps. Sorry, you want to come in. Well, I think one of one of the things that's always striking about the relationship between general and army, at least with Caesar, is all is that it that Caesar at least seems to have articulated the claim to follow him in terms of the the army's own liberty. Yes. So we have generals who are certainly interested in the personal power they can gain by their relationship with the army, but that relationship always seems to be articulated in terms of the res publica rather than the naked ambition. It always needs to be dressed up in language which, which fits with the interests of yes. the army. But you're talking about it being dressed up or real? I think in the case of Caesar it's probably dressed up but nonetheless he needed to articulate those claims in the, the, the language of popular liberty. How far, how far he genuinely thought that um, that was an element that had been underplayed, I think is a really interesting mm. question. Because he certainly, when he comes back to Rome in 49, he's doing it on the basis that an elite in Rome has hijacked the debate and they're not listening to what the community as a whole wants, yeah. which is to give honour to Caesar. Yeah. So can we go into this constitutional conflict between the ideal and the real, Melissa? Can you just develop that a bit more? Yeah, so one of the major tensions um, in the decades before Cicero's um, playing a, a key role and then during that time is between the Senate um, and the consuls on the one hand and then the tribunes of the other. So it, it was mentioned that Clodius um, was a tribune. The tribunes were elected directly by the people and they had the power to defend the people, to veto um, any um, decision of the consul, to propose laws which would speak on behalf of the people. And that tension between popular power, especially as, uh, as in state Instantiated in that form. So the Gracchi, for example, in the previous century had used their power as tribunes to try to uh, affect a kind of land redistribution. And this was remembered as by Cicero and, the, and his allies as one of the great um, 
uh, uh, moments of peril of the Republic earlier, um, which had uh, only uh, been solved in in one case by the murder um, of one of its proponents. And so, and this is actually something to which Cicero returns again and again in his political writings, that moment. Is there a sense all around, not only in Cicero, that the Republic is shaky and is even shaking and it has to be not only defended and shored up, but some way found to perpetuate it? Yeah, and I think what's so interesting to me about Cicero in this moment is that he still really believes in the norms uh, that have governed the Republic, the traditions and the mores that are associated with the offices, and then one after the other, they're falling, so they're being violated. So one example is Caesar, actually, at a relatively young age and with a lot of um, bad reputation, standing to be the Pontifex Maximus, the chief priest of the Republic, which would normally have been a sort of ancient, august man of unimpeachable reputation. And Caesar thinks, well, I can stand for that. Why not? You know, and that's an example of the... the Why was he unsuitable? Well, because um, he was known to be a womanizer, an adulterer, probably to... um, He was very... um, uh, he, he was a brilliant man and in many ways very interesting figure, but was was, was not young. Not a priest, for this, really. Yeah, not really not a, a priest, yeah. no, perhaps. Yeah. Let's cut to the chase there, okay. Um, <laughs> what was, let's kind of go back to the people now, Catherine. What, what, what was his view of the people, really, Cicero's view? Because in a sense he was nearer the people than the elite were, you could say, perhaps, on the well, scale of things. Not You're not sure, sure about that. that. I think I think his background economically and socially he's aligned with the elite. It's it's yeah. it's the broader elite rather than that bit of it that stood previously for political office. So his his view of the people, I mean, I think there's a there's a problem for him because on the one hand, within the mixed constitution to which he is entirely wedded as a form, the people have an essential role. In um, on the republic, he, he articulates this as raise pu- publica raise populi. The raise publica belongs to the people. Um, and this this fundamental authorizing capacity of the people in electing offices and in passing legislation is fundamental to the to the republic. So on the one hand, he accepts and embraces that role and acknowledges that in a in a state that is governed by justice, there needs to be an element of equality, which is represented by the role that the people play. However, his own lived experience of Roman politics showed him very clearly that the people could do all sorts of things that he didn't like. So, Such as? Well, sent him into exile. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and a whole range of other, of other things, obviously. Um, but anything less... But no, that's, that's a good, good response, but I'd like another one, mm. which is not just to do with him. Um, you mean in terms of what well, was the... Well, you said there were a whole lot of things that he didn't like. Send him in exile and pine. That's just about him. But other things he didn't like as regards to the way they appeared in the state. Well, I think it's the it's the popular trend within politics, which particularly is concerned um, often with economic measures expressed in legislation. So land redistribution, um, distribution they wanted of land redistribution. Yes, land and redistribution, didn't. and he didn't, yeah. um, because it's a challenge to property rights, yeah. um, and because it's a spending of the state's resources um, on things which perhaps it shouldn't. So there are there are those tensions, and he he tries to resolve them in his oratory. He he resolves it by saying that the people who voted aren't the real people. Um, so they're an urban mob, they're a rabble, they've been misled. But in the um, in the political treatises, um, there's the uh, theoretical response which we've had in the Republic, but there's also the pragmatic sense of how do you give the people enough power that they will be satisfied. So in On the Laws, there's a rather odd and disturbing passage where he talks about... Um, uh, voting systems and the tribunate of the plebs being enough to create the species libertatis, the appearance of freedom. So he struggles with this this tension between the ideal and what he actually saw in practice. But what we've got, Valentina, coming close to maybe this is just hindsight. We've got the shadow of tyranny, the 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 foreboding of the end of the great ideal of the republic. However, <laughs> however often it was observed in the breach, it doesn't matter. There it had gone, and going in another direction in the terrible, terrible path of tyranny, which uh, the Republic was deeply opposed to. Um, w- did Cicero sense this? What was he doing about it, given that he might have sensed it? Uh, yeah, he, he certainly, uh, throughout, fr- from from the, the sick, uh, fr- from the time he comes back from exile onwards, he keeps lamenting that the Republic is not there, is no longer there. We might have, you know, we, we keep the name of the Republic, but the true Republic is not there. It is is like um, a painting whose colours are now fading away. Um, 
However, somehow he has the gift to side always with the wrong people. <laughs> but is this, can I just pause for yes. a second, if, if I may, just okay. be clear. For is this because people like Caesar and Pompey are behaving in a way which he sees as tyrannical and therefore dangerous? Oh, yes. No, no, for, of course. So he, he supports Pompey uh, against Caesar because he saw in Caesar... Uh, the tyrant and you know he rejoices at the murder the assassination of Caesar he actually laments that he has not been invited to take to part join in, yeah. yes <laughs> and that they actually it seems you know that I was just also say that he was left out because he was renowned to be too nervous and uh, you know going on with age so it was not the case to have him around at that stage so but he was extremely uh, pleased that um, the tyrant was killed and he justifies it by saying that it the tyrant, so in a Roman citizen who behaves tyrannically, um, renounce himself um, to his uh, citizenship. What he does, he severs uh, any links with human fellowships mm -hmm. and therefore is, is like a limp of a body that no longer has blood circulating in it. So what we do, we amputate it. And therefore, this is what we have to do with a tyrant. He has to be eliminated. He justifies tyrant by saying once he stepped out of the community, he's no longer in the community. Yes, that no he one... mustn't be treated as one of the community. Excellent. Melissa, Miss Elaine, um, he explores the difference between honour and personal advantage. We've got to try in some way to intervene that the, the writings is doing, which are influential for what still are, 2,000 years. Um, what does he argue there? So this is in his last great work, The Day of Fickies, which he's writing in the very last year of his life, um, at the, just about at the moment when he's st about to stand up against Mark Antony, which will ultimately lead to his death. And it, this is his final attempt to reconcile the ideals of the Republic. And the idea is that honor, which includes the moral virtues, the social virtues, such as justice, liberality, magnanimity, decorum when properly understood, does not come into conflict with one's personal advantage. So it's the old great Greek platonic question, what should I act for my own advantage, even if it involves me in doing injustice? And Cicero structures the Dea Fickies with book one is about honor, book two is about advantage, and book three is about the seeming conflicts, only to show us that none of the seeming conflicts are real. And two of the best examples, one is tyrannicide, which he reconciles by saying it's not murder because you're saving the community from the scangrenous limb. But the other great example, there are some wonderful, much more practical examples. So he has an example of if you're selling a house, is it honorable to conceal the faults in the house when you want to have a buyer? And he ultimately ultimately argues, if you're deliberately silent so as to conceal the faults, you are yourself violating these duties of human fellowship. And so you would be behaving dishonorably, but it would also not be to your advantage because you would be violating human fellowship. So therefore, he's always able to show that the honorable and the advantageous um, coincide. Uh, Catherine, um before we move to more action, he, he wrote a lot about the, the orator, one of his great essays <coughs> was about being an orator and oration and so on. Um, what were his priorities there? And he made his name, as you said earlier in the program, this great um, defence attack on uh, Beres, the uh, Sicilian uh, um, who had uh, cheated his country so much. What were his priorities, he, he Cicero, put out for oratory? And why was it so important for him? Oratory theoretically mattered for him within the context of the res publica because it's what enables um, the right decisions to be made. He accepts that rational argument on its own isn't going to be enough in situations where large numbers of people are reaching a decision. So you need to have rational argument and then you need to persuade people to do it. So it's this practical response. And we can see that right back in his... So he regards democracy as a political act? I mean, sorry, oration is a political, oratory is a political... Oh, act. absolutely. Sorry. And in, yeah. his, in yeah. his very first um, published work, which is a, otherwise a, a not hugely interesting rhetorical handbook, I mean, you may pick me up on that, but, but it does ha nonetheless have a really interesting introduction in which the young Cicero says um, oratory is fundamental to human society. That's what creates human society. We can't come together and live together and enjoy all the benefits until we have somebody who can speak and persuade us to do that. Otherwise, we're all in a state of bestial nature. Um, and that thread, I think, goes through. He articulates it. He um, It becomes much more nuanced and exciting as a model of the good life um, and the skills that the orator needs to have. But that's the basic theoretical point. 
oratory helps communities function. In fact, it's essential for communities to function. Of course, and again, he's going back to Greece with Demosthenes, isn't he? Very much so. And his, his oratorical theory, as he develops it, is very much looking back to more philosophically informed oratory as opposed to the rather mechanical rhetorical um, treatises and handbooks that seemed to be quite dominant in rhetorical education at Rome at this time. But there's also the personal side to this. Um, Cicero was not a soldier, and therefore he was he didn't have access to all the the power and the glory and the reputation enhancing excitement of of military victory. So he sets up oratory as the civilian alternative by which you can serve and indeed save the state. Thank you, um, Valentina. What risks <coughs> what risk was uh, Cicero facing in 43 BC? Death. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the start. Is that the beginning and the end, or can we develop it a little bit? Can we protract so, the, yeah, the final execution for a moment or two? <laughs> so, yet again, he chose the wrong side. So, what <laughs> happened in uh, 44 43, he thought that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the new enemy that should be really eliminated was Mark Anthony. Why is that? Uh, because he saw the direct link, which actually was also there, between the Caesar, a direct link between. Between Caesar and Mark Antony, so he thought that Mark Antony wanted to become the next tyrant, um, and uh, he found in uh, Octavian, who then is going to become uh, Augustus. I mean, Octavian is Caesar's he, adopted son; is nineteen at the time. Yes, yes. and he, he found in him is a potential antidote, and he thought, therefore, uh, that he could support by supporting Octavian and um, pushing the Senate to act against Antony. Uh, he might have uh, eliminated, m- created some action to eliminate the, the new uh, did, threat. Did he think, please, you're going to take me away, did he think that that great speech of Mark Antony, um, in, in a sense, saying that Caesar was not a tyrant, the other, those who, as it were, did for him were tyrants, and what Caesar did was honourable and fine, and basically he was going to go and do that. Do you think that he thought that? I very much doubt it. <laughs> uh, in a, in a sense, uh, throughout C- Caesar's life, you see him at some stage supporting a line of argument, which yeah. you know, in ten years later, he might uh, reject completely. So, you know, in the sixties, he's in favour of extraordinary powers given to Pompey. In uh, forty four, forty three, that is absolutely the uh, the the end of the republic, uh, and therefore, from this point of view, it's. Um, He's he's a good politician in the sense of, you know, he works on the basis of expediency. So um, in uh, in terms of, uh, even for Octavian, in the letters, he's clearly, um, he has doubts about Octavian. He he thinks he's too young. He's politically naive. Yes. Um, So why does he go try to woo him? And but against I think because he, he, I think he thought that he was uh, the least of the two evils, yeah. and uh, by then he got it wrong, <laughs> and therefore when uh, in uh, forty three the uh, so called second triumvirate is created by the Lex Titia. So what happens is that therefore the first act that uh, uh, Mark Anthony, Octavian, and Lepidus carry out are uh, proscribing Cicero. But before that, Cicero had let out a yell of invective against uh, against Mark Antony. He yes. Not only backed the the wrong horse, but uh, attacked the wrong enemy. That's right. <laughs> Very much so. And uh, you know, uh, even um, did the he attack him on grounds? Invective is a word used. Did he attack him on grounds which were which were consonant with his philosophy? Hmm. I.e., beware yeah, the tyrant. Yeah, yeah, no, I see. Yes. I see what you mean. Uh, y- yes. Yes and no. Yet again, so it's um, invective was a, an essential part of uh, of rhetoric and uh, political life, and uh, you know, so invective was mainly personal. So invective was uh, was also about the way you looked, your sexual taste, uh, habits, um, your um, desire for food, and he was so. And Anthony has all the traits of excessiveness of a tyrant. So it's all part of the same picture. Is that slightly out of character? Is Cicero going uh, off the scale here, Melissa? 
Well, it's interesting. I think he realizes that it's his last great act of political life. And he actually he actually says in one of the Philippics, I have laid the basis for a new constitution. So I think he sees it as the last throw of the dice to try to rid the republic of this new tyrant and thereby um, refound the Roman constitution, although he knows that it's very unlikely to succeed. Was it did he uh, did he um, know the danger he was in, or was it uh, did he think that he was going to get away with it, and he and Octavian were going to live happily ever after and start the republic again? Well, I think until Octavian makes the common cause with Antony and Lepidus, he may have that fantasy. But at the moment that that happens, he knows he's done for. One of the interesting things, of course, is that many of his allies at that point had committed suicide. Um, Cato, as a as a Stoic, had committed suicide when the battle against Caesar was a crucial battle had been lost. And it's interesting that Cicero never really seems to have considered that path. I mean, he is not a Stoic. He, I think, ultimately does recognize that death is a kind of evil, although he debates that question with himself and some of his other writings. So he's willing to suffer death bravely, but he doesn't take that act of of, um, of suicide. But as soon as that comes out, Mark Antony is after him, and Cicero escapes to one of his houses, and they find him, and yeah. they slaughter him. Yeah. How, how efficient, um, how was that done, the slaughtering? Knives. <laughs> no, but what did, what was left of him? Well, the stories are that his his head and his hands were cut off and they were taken to um, uh, Rome and Fulvia, who was Antony's wife but had been previously married to Clodius, um, pinned them up on the speaker's platform. Right. Um, and that the hand mattered because it was the hand that had written the Philippic. The Philippic being the diatribe yeah. against... Uh, yeah. Antony. And she stuck a, a, hat pin, a hairpin through his tongue. That it happens through his time. I think that's enough for the, for, the, for the present. I think we can move on now to very briefly. I'm sorry to spring this. Anyway. What do you think his legacy was? I mean, I was reading him at school in the 20th century. I'm sure people in the 20th <laughs> staggering through it, 21st century. So his legacy has gone on for a long time. Yes, for sure. Well, perhaps there are, as I see it, there are, I would say, three main areas. Uh, his language, as you said. <laughs> People are still reading Cicero and learning Latin through his texts. We read Cicero as an historical source, if you want to know about uh, the history of the late Republic. Um, but we also read Cicero as a political thinker. Uh, he has not only influenced a number of uh, thinker, political thinkers throughout the centuries, but even nowadays with a renaissance of republicanism and neo-republicanism, uh, the idea of, of Cicero and how a republic should be governed is very much upfront in our thinking. There is Melissa. He also translated Greek philosophy into Latin and left us with a, a, an enriched vocabulary for what it is to think philosophically. He's a wonderful writer, and almost whatever you're interested in about how to be a civilised human in society, you can find something interesting in him. In him. Yes, because his essays cover a wide range. We've only yeah. old, old age, friendship, um, a whole range of, of more technical philosophical Greek treatises, and we haven't even started talking about the letters. That will have to be <laughs> another time. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine, Catherine Steele, Miss Elaine, Valentina, Aaron. And next week we'll be discussing the world of cephalopods, the octopus, squid, cuttlefish, and nautilus. Thanks for listening. And the In Our Time podcast gets some extra time now with a few minutes of bonus material from Melvin and his guests. Right, now you're back on again. Um, do you think we got to the heart of what we set out to do? I think we did. I think we did. But when I was thinking about this programme and drawing it, it seemed to me that, that it's interesting that when we talk about Cicero's political philosophy, one thing we never even touch on is slavery. And it does seem to me extraordinary that we can talk about the about political philosophy within a society that's based on slavery and is that because Cicero just never just never talks about it that's my sense it's just not a problem for him or however much he's interested in libertas Mm -hmm. Um, now why is that because it's not that the Romans have a total blind spot on this look at Seneca no you're right he doesn't mention that Uh, there is he does however um, does consider the liberty so the freedmen as a political entity, because one thing I think we have missed out is actually the processio. So what happens mm. just before the De Repubblica, so the, the, the great political city, um, he, when he writes this uh, speech in defense of Cestius, um, halfway through the speech, he almost forgets the case of uh, the, the legal case, and he embarks in uh, a redefinition of the political uh, entities, the political players of Rome. And in doing so, when he claims 
the optimates include include not only you know the members of the elite, mm-hmm. the senators, the equitors, but also people from the municipal towns, of course, like him. But even the liberty. So what he's talking about, even the, even ex slaves. Mm-hmm. So we, contrary to, to Greece, we are talking about a society that allows a slave to become a citizen, and actually not only then to be a, uh, entitled to vote. Mm-hmm. But even according to this redefinition, to be considered an optimatist, so mm-hmm. around uh, a political active player, around the, who, whose consensus it becomes essential, from his point of view, uh, to rebuilding mm-hmm. a res publica around the Senate. Yes, I, th- I think that's right, and I think one of the things that that we could have looked at in more detail is this question of, of language to redescribe the different entities within the state. Um, so this, this massive broadening of what elite means that he does in Processio because he's, he's so keen to create a consensus of everybody who isn't Clodius and his followers yes. and to kind of restrict Clodius and his followers into a, into a small gap. We didn't talk about hostis. The way mm. that, that... And it's, Cicero isn't the first person to do this. The way that the Roman elite uses the word hostis, an ex- external enemy, to somehow solve internal crisis mm-hmm. by expelling the offending members from the state and thus taking, thus sidestepping the whole legal problem of how do you, um, how do you exercise, how do you deal with, execute whatever your own citizens. If you call them hostes, you kind of solve the problem. And and I think there's a there's a, a link there between um, the way that you can that Cicero can then say that the tyrant is not part of the state. Yes. I, I think the other point about slavery, to go back to that, is that in the De Legibus, the idea of the multiple layers of law, so we have natural law, but then we have the the Usgentium, the law of all the nations, and then we have the the, the, the civil law yeah. of, of, of a nation like Rome. And so I think he's very willing to accept that the customs on the whole, the legal customs and traditions and institutions of Rome, have a kind of validity and standing. And so he's not going to question something yeah. like slavery, which yeah. um, is part of those part of those traditions. Yes. What do you think he could have done to save himself at the end? I don't think he I mean, wanted had he to. Merely, had he merely not, I don't, that's what I was I don't think get, he wanted to. That's, that's what I'm trying to yeah, get I think so That act he did, did he know? I mean, he must have known. Yeah, he must Wasn't have known. Was that just a foolhardiness? Or? Well, I, I think in a sense, you know, as Valentina said already, for many years he had thought that the republic that he had lived in was dead. All the great figures that of his kind of youth and early career, most of them were dead by this stage. You mentioned Cato. Who else was dead? Uh, well, by this time, Caesar is dead. Yeah. You know, um, Brutus, uh, well, is a little bit later after after Cicero. But, you know, the, the, the sort of great figures of the age have all, have mostly fallen. Pompey, Crassus, obviously. Um, and so, um, and so in a sense, um, I think, you know, in a sense, he has nothing else to play for and he wants to go down fighting and he makes that mm. choice. And I think, as Valentina yeah. said, one of the really striking things is he was a, in some ways a good judge of principles, but a terrible judge of character. Mm. And I think because he couldn't ex- he couldn't understand people whose ambition was not just to be first among equals, as his was, mm. but to really break with equality altogether. So men like Caesar and Antony and Octavian, that driving ambition that led them to destroy the forms of the Republic that in some way maintained equality, he could just never understand that. He thought he could control them. He thought it wasn't they, it wasn't real. And, and then he was wrong every time. And there's a sense, too, that... Um, I mean, if we want to, if we want to try and per- if we want to personalise this in, in terms of what kind of person Cicero was, there is that sense that he was always being called back to a, a sense of a personal ideal. I'm, that letter at the end of sixty, when he's been asked to join Caesar and Pompey um, in this, you know, this informal compact that they're going to run Rome with, he's asked to join and he refuses, and he quotes Homer um, uh, at that point, uh, and it, it's a sort of he, it's a personal line he can't step over. It's not consonant with his own self-conception um, and so he, he's he's not able to join Caesar in 49 although at some level I think he knows that prudentially that might be the thing to do mm-hmm. um, because of what Caesar stands for um, in breaking the Republic rather than trying to operate within it in some way though as Pompey did though I, I mean the other thing about it is he had no illusions about Pompey either I mean yeah. it's quite clear that had Pompey yeah, yeah, won yeah. there would have been so these prescriptions and generals were 
were, were, were in really sort well I know producers trying banging on the door trying to get in to break up this little republic uh, but but basically in one way you could say that these mil- the might of these military generals is that were the biggest distorting factor I think so and the failure to find a way of controlling it I mean it had always been a destabilizing factor but the Senate had always somehow managed yeah. to keep it in check well here's the producer with news for us all only the offer of tea and coffee <laughs> <laughs> Coffee, please. Thank you. Coffee, please. Mm. Me too. Thank you. Can we come back and do the cuttlefish? <laughs> In Our Time with Melvin Bragg is produced by Simon Tillotson. Hi, I'm Rihanna Dillon, and I just wanted to let you know about another podcast that I think you might like. It's called Seriously, and twice a week we bring you incredible documentaries from BBC Radio 4. We like to say they're seriously interesting stories told a little sideways. From politics to fashion, arts to current affairs, I'm sure there will be something that takes your fancy. So join me there. Just search for Seriously in your favourite podcast app.